Uh, good evening. This is the 6 p.m. press conference for the CZU complex. My name is Jonathan Cox, Deputy Chief for CAL FIRE here in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. Uh, as always, if you could just mute your telephones, please take any conversations uh, outside the press briefing area uh, and keep your masks on at all times. Just uh, wanted to bring everybody up to speed after uh, the weather came through yesterday and we found ourselves here uh, getting wet uh, last night. Uh, over the course of the evening uh, across California, the CAL FIRE confirmed that there were over 300 lightning strikes uh, in, in the state overall. Uh, ten of those caused new fires or ten new fires uh, occurred overnight uh, and zero, none of those fires uh, occurred in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. So no lightning caused fires over the last 24 hours which if you remember when we were standing here 24 hours ago, we were all highly concerned about with the red flag conditions. With that, on the uh, CZU uh, Lightning Complex, t this evening we're up to 78,684 acres. Obviously, we get more specific on the numbers, uh, the more we're able to ground truth it with people on the ground, uh, and we are, we are confirming 78,684 acres this evening. We remain at 13% contained, uh, and have over 25,000 structures that still remain threatened due to the fire. We also can confirm this evening that 276 structures have been destroyed. Uh, that is both in San Mateo and Santa Cruz County. A large majority of those structures are in Santa Cruz County, uh, and obviously that information will get down to the specifics as it gets released to each EOC at the county level. Uh, and finally, uh, some even better news, uh, we're up to 1,609 firefighters, uh, personnel assigned to this incident. Uh, obviously every number uh, of firefighters that comes on the line has a direct correlation to the percent increase in containment that we can gain, uh, so that's a welcome, a welcome development for us. With that, uh, I'm going to pass it off for an operational overview from CAL FIRE IMT3 Ops Section Chief Mark Brunton. Good evening. So today with the weather that we had uh, really led us to get in there and do a lot of good work. We had a lot of progress in the fire today uh, with the clear air. We were able to fly a lot more aircraft. I'll address that here shortly. And uh, on the ground, uh, again, as uh, Chief Cox said, that we brought in more uh, resources and we were able to get more heavy equipment, the bulldozers and so forth, that are going to help us uh, construct those, those lines. So a lot of good work going on. Uh, predominantly up in the north zone, uh, we're, we're having good progress with our line construction continuing. Uh, the fire still is backing into Lomar Mar and, and uh, Butano, but uh, again, it's pretty much creeping. We are monitoring that. It's not making any sort of threat to those communities, but it is still uh, advancing, all, albeit slowly. Uh, there is a, a, a haul road on the, in Division Golf and Kilo that I've been talking about. Uh, that line's been improved. The fire is creeping down into that. It's holding, which is great because uh, that is keeping fire from, from making any sort of advancement into uh, potentially Santa Clara County. So that's looking really good. We're very happy with the results there. As we're looking at the Highway 9 corridor, continued uh, work along that uh, corridor. Uh, again, as I've uh, uh, said before, difficult terrain to work in, uh, very steep terrain, heavy fuels. Not the most ideal area to put our control lines like we typically do, but it is, uh, we're making do with it. We're making it work and it is holding in most all locations. Um, in the state park down uh, below uh, Ben Loman, continued work in there. Uh, that's gonna be one of our challenge points, one of those areas that's gonna be a lot of work, a lot of planning, but we are making advancements there uh, throughout. The south skin looking really good. Our, our containment line, our primary or secondary line uh, on that south part of the fire is solid. The area that we burned in yesterday, fantastic. It's holding, it's doing what we want. Any fire that has burned down to that is either self mitigated meaning extinguished, uh, or it is holding on that line, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So it really, really minimizes that uh, threat to Santa Cruz and the UC campus. So it's looking really good, very happy with that, those results. In Bonnie Dune, uh, continued work within around those structures. Again, painstaking work, a lot of structures out there, a lot of heavy fuels, uh, still some fire creeping throughout that. Uh, but again, that's a lot of work just digging in and, and getting after it and taking care of business. We did a, a small burn operation along Empire Grade Road uh, to Martin Road that kind of puts in a nice uh, control line for us. So it keeps spread going uh, to the west and, and affecting more homes. So that's a good, good uh, control line we did to button that little bit up. And then as far as our uh, air program, didn't fly any of the fixed wing air tankers on it, didn't really have a need for that, but what was critical is the flight, the use of our helicopters. We have six water dropping helicopters assigned to this incident, 
and today was some of the best day yet. We were able to drop 200,000, that's 200,000 gallons uh, throughout the day in fire suppression activities uh, with our helicopters. So with our ground uh, troops, our aerial uh, air force going, uh, great day and a lot of good work out there and a, a lot of advancement work moving forward with the weather we're expecting. I think we're gonna have more days like this and uh, hopefully get us closer to the end of, of uh, suppressing this fire. Uh, speaking next from the Santa Cruz County uh, Sheriff's Office, uh, is Chief Deputy Chris Clark. Well, good evening. So I wanted to touch on a few things, uh, a few things tonight. One, uh, 79 personnel work in the valley. If you've been, uh, if you've been displaced, I, I want you to know uh, and kind of get a feeling and an understanding of kind of what our police presence looks like uh, near your home. And so today, 79 folks worked, worked the San Lorenzo Valley. That was 33 of our people here at the Sheriff's Office. And, and, and we were aided by 46 uh, additional officers through mutual aid uh, from agencies over the hill as well as in, within, the, within our county. And I kind of want to give you an idea of kind of what typically that situation would look like, just to kind of give you some perspective of how much police presence is up here. So uh, the San Lorenzo Valley, when it comes to policing, you, that's, that's broken into three separate beats, three separate zones. Uh, policed by basically uh, at any one given time over a 24 hour period under normal circumstances and be policed by three deputies. So today we had 79 and not only that we broke those three zones down into 17 specific zones. So to kind of give you an idea three larger zones broken down into 17 more specific areas manned by 79 uh, officers and deputies. Uh, in those zones driving around and looking for uh, people that shouldn't be there or responding to people that needed uh, that needed evacuating or, or had an emergency that uh, that they needed help with uh, in terms of calls for service so today uh, we responded to 17 suspicious people uh, or persons calls that came in as well as 11 welfare checks and uh, and we did make arrests and so you know our guys are out there again I want to assure the folks in San Lorenzo Valley they were committed to providing this police presence and looking for people that are potentially looking to prey on, on uh, you and, uh, and your neighbors. And so I'll, I wanna highlight a couple of these arrests today. So today we arrested two folks. One was a, was a 51 year old woman who uh, uh, in Felton that, uh, that, uh, that uh, was in, an evac in the evacuated zone, should not have been there. Another one was a 49 year old man from Santa Cruz. We got into a short pursuit with him uh, when we ended up, uh, uh, when, that, when he ended up stopping uh, we found $5,000 in cash, a set of binoculars, and a video camera. And so that person went to jail for obviously getting into a pursuit with us, resisting arrest, and then being in an evacuated zone. And then we cited two other folks, again, for being in the evacuated zone. They, they, although they, they, they resided there, they were in the evacuated zone, should not have been there. And again, just touching on that, I mean, we completely empathize with people wanting to come back. And we, we get it. You're displaced. I mean, we and I've said this before, that we have our own personnel that have been evacuated during this fire that, that really would love to go back and sleep, and, you know, sleep in their own bed. But it's just make, until this fire gets under, more, it gets under control, uh, it's just imperative that people stay out of the area to allow CAL FIRE to do their job and allow us really to focus on the people that shouldn't be there. Uh, in terms of, uh, and on another note, so with regards to, the, you know, there's been an outpouring of, uh, of interest in the firefighters, uh, the firefighter who got his truck broken into and his wallet stolen, and so I think everybody agrees that that I mean that's just it, it, that conduct is just it, it's absolutely it's outrageous. So especially for people trying to help, and so what I wanted to do is so our detectives, uh, they they through leads and through their investigation, they uh, and I'm going to need your help on this, and so I'm going to show you some pictures, and so the, for uh, for the media, these photos will be available to you, but the fi the, the firefighter who lost his wallet. His cards were used at the Safeway uh, grocery store on 41st Avenue in Capitola and the Shell gas station in Santa Cruz. And then his cards were also used uh, to purchase uh, or attempted to purchase a uh, Bitcoin. And so it was about a $2,000 loss. Um, here's a more close up view. So we believe this person is likely a Valley resident, likely a Bonnie Dune resident. And really what we're hoping is that if you've been evacuated from the Bonnie Dune area, you may recognize him. And so uh, again, uh, I, I'm holding a picture here. This will get posted to social media. And so maybe, maybe you recognize him. Maybe it's the giant's hat. Maybe it's the, the, the longer, uh, lighter colored hair. But either way, this picture will be available. Take a look at it. We encourage you to take a look at it. 
and, and help us in identifying who this person is. Uh, the firefighter himself, uh, we, and again, outpouring of support. I, I feel the call literally from Kansas City, Missouri today from a lady who said, we would love to set up a GoFundMe in Kansas City because we just, we, we can't believe that somebody would do that to, to people that are willing to help. Uh, the firefighter's family has said that the, as much as they appreciate it, they just, at this point, they, the in, insurance has reimbursed them uh, and they don't need the assistance, but that just shows you the, the national spread of, of just this event and kind of, I think, just overall kind of how we feel about that sort of conduct. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it, it's crazy. Um, a couple other things. So on another note, and really a somber note, I, I spoke last night about a person who we found deceased at the end of Last Chance Road. Uh, today we identified uh, that man as 73-year-old Tad Jones, and so we've uh, we've spoken to his family as a last chance resident, and so uh, there there'll be an autopsy pending to determine the, the cause of death there, but um, and more information to come. But uh, but we identified him and spoke to his family. Uh, I want to talk about cell service for just a second. So uh, as I mentioned last night, Verizon and AT&T cell service was a little sporadic. Uh, Verizon was able to make some improvements today, so Verizon coverage should be better within the valley. AT&T was working today uh, to kind of fix their issue, so hopefully that will get uh, that that will get fixed as well. Um, uh, we also have been fielding a lot of calls. So the city of Santa Cruz issued, a, and I mentioned this this morning, issued a, they issued a pre-warning for the city of Santa Cruz, and there's a lot of I know we feel a lot of calls from a lot of uneasy residents, and I just want to let you know that based on the information that we have, uh, there, there's no imminent danger to the city of Santa Cruz at this time. Uh, but nonetheless, that pre-warning went out, obviously, to keep people better prepared, and so that's that's why that happened. Um, and then, in terms of evacu in terms of evacuations uh, for another city, uh, there was a rumor going around Facebook, and really, it, well, this rumor was about uh, it started with basically somebody saying, "Hey, uh, the city of Scotts Valley, the order's been lifted. You can go back home if you live in the city of Scotts Valley." That's false. That's that's not true. And so we, we put something out on social media, the city of Scotts Valley put something out on social media. And so really, I just encourage that, encourage you that, you know, I know people are on social media, we, we, but, but go to a trusted site, right? Go to Cal Fire, uh, go to the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office, San Mateo Sheriff's Office to get information, make sure that the, the source is valid. Um, and then lastly, uh, I, I just want to touch on a couple uh, resources for people. You know, in, in terms of, you know, you've been displaced, you know, there may be costs that aren't covered by your insurance company. And, and I've said this before, I, I really, I feel for people. I mean, with COVID and, and with, you know, the, if the financial hardship that that brings, especially at a time like this, if insurance doesn't cover uh, your loss, I, can, I can't even imagine uh, how, how, you would, uh, how you'd feed a family, how you'd survive. But nonetheless, I found two resources today that I wanted to pass along to be able to help uh, people who, with with things that uh, that maybe not covered by their insurance. So one is uh, it's it's a website, disasterassistance.gov, disasterassistance.gov, and then the other is a FEMA app. So if you go on to, into the app store or whatever uh, you know a application uh, uh, vendor you have, uh, for, you know whether you have an iPhone or um, or an Android, but you download the FEMA app, and there's resources on there that would be able to help you. Uh, if you had costs that uh, you couldn't get reimbursed through normal channels. Thank you. Speaking next from the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office is Sergeant Saul, Z excuse me, Sergeant Saul Zuno. Good evening. As uh, Deputy Chief Clark mentioned, uh, we have safety and security teams that are patrolling the areas that have been affected and evacuated 24 hours a day. Uh, we're doing this to protect your property. We're doing this to keep you safe and to also keep suspicious people out. Um, we, have, we did have an incident where some people snuck in to try to check on their property and, and ended up getting caught in a hazard. So I just want to remind you, please do not attempt to go back to check on your property. Uh, if your property has been affected by fire, there are a lot of unknown hazards that the fire professionals still have to go and inspect and verify. We know that you're very eager to go back home and once it is safe to do so, we will let you know. Um, as of right now, there's no date to cancel any evacuation order. We have also heard rumors, so that's not true because the fire is still very active. Uh, and also, in uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are taking advantage of uh, the people's uh, vulnerability and there are a lot of uh, fire related scams going on right now with social media. Uh, just want to remind you guys, 
Fire personnel, law enforcement personnel in uniform will never approach you and ask you for money. They're never going to call your home and ask you for money. So if you receive a phone call, something via social media, please vet it before you donate any funds. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaking next, representing all of the unified command agencies uh, in control of this incident is CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, Incident Commander Billy C. Good evening. Obviously, uh, you're probably hearing some of the helicopters flying around. That's a good day. Obviously, we're able to uh, get the uh, rotor wing up today, working on this incident, and I believe we're going to be timing all six helicopters out on this incident today, which is a good firefighting day for our folks out on the ground. As we move into the next three or four days, we're looking at an onshore uh, a wind pattern that will increase the humidities, decrease the temperatures a bit. Still at the higher elevations, we're still looking at very dry conditions. Um, at the lower elevations, it, it's going to temper the fire activity. The fire is challenging some of the lines and some of the places, but it's a backing, slow, progressing fire. Our uh, firefighters are out on the ground. They're working aggressively to get containment lines put in. Obviously, there's some difficulties in some areas. Uh, what we normally try to do traditionally is work on high ridge lines. And obviously now we're down in lower drainages, side hills, and mid slope behind the homes trying to protect the infrastructure best as possible. So our traditional methods of what we normally do is going to be uh, challenged with this incident just because of the amount of intermix of homes and the uh, terrain features that are out there. Obviously we increased our uh, personnel numbers today. Although small, it is an increase and it's a benefit to this incident and we'll continue to see a trickle effect of both personnel and resources showing up here over the next few days. Thank you. And our final speaker representing uh, CAL FIRE San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit, Ian Chief, uh, excuse me, Unit Chief Ian Larkin. As Chief C uh, just stated, uh, we're starting to make progress uh, and with the resources along with the, uh, the improved weather our crews are out there working as hard as they can. The terrain they're working in is very treacherous, very steep. Uh, they have steep canyons um, that are making it difficult for them to get in there and uh, get the direct line uh, put in. But uh, they're working as hard as they possibly can and as fast as they can uh, in an attempt uh, to get people back into the area. Um, also, our cooperating agencies such as PG&E and um, other agencies are out there inspecting their infrastructure in order to get power and everything back into the areas uh, before we can uh, start to let evacuees back in. Um, that's going to take a little bit of time, so we continue to ask for your patience. Um, let us get the work done that needs to be done to make that environment as safe as possible so that we can get people back into their residence. Um, as you heard today, we it's a welcome sight to be able to get aircraft up. Um, you know, that's been one of the factors that has helped uh, hamper our uh, efforts is not to be able to fly our aircraft um, in order to help uh, control the, um, the fire. Um, as I keep saying, this is a historic event, um, and with that comes everything with that. It's going to be a long process. This is a long haul. It's not something that's just going to be going away at the end of September or October. We're going to be here dealing with this thing for more than a year, the aftermath of it. So um, please be diligent with us and uh, have some patience, and we'll get you try to get you back into your homes and get this thing controlled as soon as we can. Thank you. All right, happy to answer any questions. Yep. Can you clarify um, for residents who are found uniformly giving them citations if they are in the evacuation zone, or only if they do something they're found in the So the question is related to our, uh, is the Sheriff's Department citing people in the evacuation zone uniformly, uniformly or on case by case basis? Yeah, so my instruction to our patrol staff is, is, is exactly what I'd mentioned in, in this press conference, which is just that, that if you're, that, and I've said this before, and, and their instruction is, if you're in the evacuated area, you shouldn't be there. It's against the law. We understand. And again, we empathize with, with somebody's desire to go there. But no, if you're in the evacuated area, you're going to get a citation. And then if you're in the evacuated area and you're there doing something else you shouldn't be or you absolutely have no business being there at all because you're not even a resident of the area, you're likely going to jail. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the question was related to people in Bonnie Doon who haven't uh, haven't left and feel as though they're they're there to protect. And this issue has come up uh, a couple times. There's there's two things that uh, I think we can say pretty firmly. One is that we do not want anybody to get hurt or 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 or, or become in, trapped. Um, and by that I mean we use air tankers with 20,000 gallons of, of retardant in that. We use fire as a tool to actually stop an oncoming fire. Uh, and if those types of operations are not coordinated or communicated to other people that might be out there, the last thing we want to happen is an inju a preventable injury to happen on the line, on the fire line. So our perspective is, is obviously very concerned with safety and people's health and well-being. Having said that, uh, as a human, uh, I, I can sympathize with them for wanting to save their property and, and, and their community that they love. Um, our message is, uh, you know, we need space to operate. We need to be in the evacuated zone um, to be able to get our crews in, to be able to work safely. Uh, and nothing uh, uh, is more important than having the space and the ability to do that. Uh, people who decide to stay on their property and defend their own property is, is obviously their choice. Um, but any sort of organization that may impede with firefighting operation uh, is not only uh, uh, potentially harmful for them, but it's potentially harmful for our firefighters as well. Yeah. Today the governor made a point that mutual aid in California is something to take pride in. Can you talk about how mutual aid has benefited this incident? Yeah, I mean, uh, so this comes up uh, kind of year over year, our mutual aid system in California. You know, the unfortunate reality of living in California is that the system that deploys resources to any type of disaster is well-versed and well-oiled machine. It happens daily on small incidents uh, locally, all the way up to incidents like we're, we're seeing right now. Um, and because it's utilized so often, the implementation of it is, is, is faster than anywhere else that in the nation. Uh, and what that really means is you can get a resource from L.A. County um, on the road within hours to head up to Santa Cruz County. Uh, and the coordination that goes into that, the, the, the kind of the backside of, of communications, the financial payment side of things, uh, identification, all of those things are already pre-established. With that being said, when you have over two dozen large incidents break out literally on the same night, it is going to test the mutual aid system because um, there's a finite number of resources, obviously, uh, and to get everybody on the road at the same time, you know, it's literally a capacity issue. How big is the, the bandwidth of the pipe to get, to get all that information uh, flowed to the right agency? So uh, I think we all take pride in the system we work with here in California as far as mutual aid is concerned. Um, I tell you what, there, there, is, there is no way in California that you can deal with an emergency of this size without that full force uh, kind of all hands on deck that is, that is mutual aid here. A lot of talk about progress today, which is great. Uh, are there other parts of the fire? What is the most uh, dangerous part of this fire that could, you know, break out or, or get worse? Is there like a specific part? Yes. Yeah, so Ian, if I'm hearing you correct, the question is what's the, the most dangerous spot on the fire right now? Yeah, I think Mark would be the best to answer that. Yeah, certainly um, probably the most challenging and the, the one that we're most concerned with is on the Highway 9 corridor. Uh, basically from where you see division K all the way down to about division WW, Whiskey Whiskey. That's the, that whole stretch of, uh, is the most active. That's the area that as uh, Chief C mentioned earlier and I mentioned earlier is uh, very problematic in the fact that we can't employ our traditional strategy and tactics there uh, due to the topography, due to the fuel loading and so forth. Um, because of that and, and because that has more of the open flank of the fire and that, that's our that's our challenge. That's the one that that we're really having to uh, put our plans um, to be very careful with our plans, or to, and make sure that we really look at that closely. We have to do a lot of reconnaissance in that area. It's just not our typical go-to um, bread and butter type operation that we have to do there. So because of that, and because it is painstakingly slow, because you have to go through around a bunch of homes and so forth. Uh, that 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 one is the concerning to us and and uh, and to myself and my staff. Uh, the area in, in Bonnie Dune that's just going to take time. Um, a lot of it is as complicated per se and technical, but it's because of the amount of the resource, the structures, and the limited uh, resource we have to go and and get every hot spot and get around every home. That's just going to be time uh, take time. 
The other parts of the fire, a uh, little bit more straightforward. And uh, once we have some specialized resources, we'll be able to get a lot of production around that, that uh, western part of the fire and into the north part of the fire. Uh, it's just once we get those resources. But yes, uh, to answer your question, that eastern part of the fire is, is my concern right now. Sure. So the question is related to the progress and actions that were taken out on the areas behind Ben Loman, uh, especially in relation to the air attack. Chief Brunton. <clears throat> Certainly. So what you were uh, witnessing there was a lot of the work that we we're doing, as I was mentioned earlier, uh, around the backside of those structures, in particular just below uh, Ben Loman in, in the state park, um, and then moving from that north. So what we're doing, we've uh, put in some uh, line, uh, both hand line and, and dozer line, early in the incident to, to check the fire up, if you will, to, to slow its progress and move forward. Not the kind of finished, completed line that we really like to use where, where uh, it, it has a full control factor and we can use it to our advantage to extinguish and, and put out the fire. So now we're going back, we're improving that hasty line. We, uh, you saw the, the helicopters dropping there to support the crews down below because of the active fire. We, you know, they're, they're on their own. We don't always have maybe a hose that we can put in there with them. Uh, so they're out there with their hand tools or with the dozers and the, the helicopters are supporting that effort. So they're extinguishing, cooling things down so our, our ground troops can get in there and put in that good control line. So that's, that's uh, what you saw. That's what you're gonna continue to see for the coming days, that same operation, and that's what's going on there. And, and as it, you'll see that progressing up the valley and that's, that's good progress. You can almost monitor the pro progress by just following that activity up the valley. All right, everybody who's up here will be available for questions uh, after this press conference. Uh, just a reminder, we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Uh, I want to conclude the press conference and say thank you for joining us.